Hello, everyone. My guest today is Jim Fowler. He is the founder of a company called Owler, the crowdsourced competitive intelligence platform that business professionals use to outsmart their competition, gain insights, and uncover the latest industry news and alerts. Before Owler, he founded Jigsaw in 2003 and was CEO until it was acquired by Salesforce in 2010 for 175 million bucks. Jim, you ready to take us to the top? Yes, sir. All right, Owler. So first off, I love the platform. In fact, I paid to put a promo through you guys and it, and it did you know, fairly well. You've built a massive network of business professionals. Why are they using Owler? Give us the overview. Uh, we've got over uh, 3 million business professionals using this now on a daily basis. And um, it's a crowdsourced platform where you get information about companies that you care about, whether you're a salesperson, a CEO, a product person, uh, and uh, you, when you give information about it, um, you get a lot more information back, which is the beauty of a crowdsourced model. So in, business professionals use us to stay on top of companies that they care about, either from a competitive perspective because they're customers uh, or because you know, they're, they're um, uh, p- potentially a, an investment company as well. A lot of investors use this as well. And explain to me with any kind of data platform like this source of truth and how you get data is obviously critical for folks to understand. So explain how you capture data. Sure. So most uh, many of our users use it for free. It's a freemium model in a way like LinkedIn. Uh, And the idea is, is that you're getting news in particular, but we also give a lot of other insights about companies. So for instance, uh, we might say that, hey, this company just acquired another company. Uh, and at that time, we'll ask them to do something like perhaps rate the CEO of the company or, um, hey, what's the, uh, if for a private company, estimate the revenue of that company. So we kind of use a wisdom of crowds model to get information about these companies that's very difficult to get. Yep. Uh, revenue of the employee is one of the most important ones. How do you, so obviously if, you know, someone is on the Inc. 5,000, you see the revenue, you, someone will report that into Owler, you have really accurate numbers on those kinds of companies. There are a lot of companies though that are pretty private. And the knock I've seen on Owler is that there are some where you might, or your crowd might say the revenue is 2 million, but the CEO is like, Nathan, just so you know, we're doing like 30 million, right? So how do you make sure you don't lose the trust of these kind of 3 million daily users? Right. So the, the, we actually had to deal with this at Jigsaw as well, because what people want when they deal with business information or any kind of database is they want perfection and they want it for free usually. And, uh, the reality is, is that all we have to do is be a lot better than Dun & Bradstreet. Who's really <laughs> the, um, and we blow those guys away. So we've done every year. One of our critical benchmarks is how good is our data comparative to Dun & Bradstreet? And we, we blow them away in terms of accuracy. Unfortunately, it's not perfect. And so what we're trying to do is just provide the best possible that we can get. Yep. And these people that are, you know, you know, I early on when you launched, because you came back on in September 26, I became a user of Owler. And so occasionally when I get an email, I would actually go in and rate a CEO or, you know, I talked to a CEO and then saw it wasn't accurate on Owler. So I put in the accurate information, like like whether it was revenue or employee counts or things like that. Who, who are typically the ones that are providing that feedback? Is it usually investors or CEOs wanting their profile to be accurate so they update it themselves? Like who is it usually? It, it, that's a great question. It was the same with Jigsaw, which is, of course, also a crowd, you know, crowdsourced database. It's really interesting um, because I've always gone in and really tried to get a, a handle on who are these. I call them data geeks. And yes. you're clearly one of them. And we love you. We, <laughs> we worship you. Um, and the reality is there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's um, humans are kind of like ants or bees. You know, we, we are workers. And we want, we like to build things and make them right. And it's, it, it's that gene that gets triggered and it can be from everywhere. Um, sometimes it's salespeople, sometimes it's product people, sometimes it is. We love, by the way, um, investors uh, because they have a very good view. So we really look hard and our algorithms weight different votes differently, by the way. It's not just, a you know, there's a lot behind the scenes in our algorithm. Yeah, an investor who's sitting on the board who gives a a revenue update, you know you can probably trust, right? What we have found is that people tell the truth far more often than they lie. Because what we try to do is go out and say, okay, we know this answer. Now, how do we figure out who's giving us correct? One of the things we thought at the beginning was, you know, if you competed with a company, you would go and give inaccurate information about that company. We've actually seen that does happen, but it's not the norm. It's We found some really 
there's always really crazy, interesting things you learn from crowds. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. So this is interesting. Again, I love the model. We geeked out there a little bit, but tell me the revenue model. How do you guys make money? So we, we, uh, have just launched a freemium model now and that's doing really well. Um, but, uh, we also do huge data deals. It, it actually follows a lot what we did with Jigsaw where we go out. Um, we've actually, um, now closed a couple of deals above a million dollars a year with customers because they'll, of course, everyone builds this database. It's a corpus of information that, that really doesn't you know, have a mirror anywhere else in the market. And so we're able to go out there and in a data as a service or a SaaS model, uh, you know, um, do these deals where we get multi-year contracts to use large data. Mm -hmm. And are you these explain to me kind of what's in one of these million dollar kind of deals. If I'm paying you a million bucks per year, are, are you feeding into like I now have a direct API connection to Salesforce and the hourly information updates on my Salesforce records or like what typically is included in that? That's actually our, our pro where we actually pump our a lot of the news alerts about companies into Salesforce. Um, the uh, it's all API deals um, with these big million dollar deals. So they'll they'll want um, different fields in our database. So it's a very Jigsaw really brought the concept of data as a service to market, and now many people do it. Um, you know, Dun and Bradstreet copied that model for you know. I'm quite proud of that. Um, but the whole point is is that uh, it's all about just taking whatever of our fields, and we have many fields in our database. Some people want them all. Some people just want some of them. What's the most popular uh, field that people want? For sure, it would be uh, revenue, private company revenue. It's just a difficult one to get and number of employees. Because if you think about it, every company uses those two fields to set sales territories. Now, do you will you do things like analyze all of the the Nordic right government reports and then use that because they have to report certain things, then use that as a sample cohort to project upon similar U.S. companies and project or guess their revenue? Um, that's a hell of an idea, Nathan. And no, we don't do that yet. Um, right now, we're really focusing on getting the, the U.S. market because they don't have to report. I, I think a lot of U.S. listeners may not be aware, as you are that most of the European companies require private companies to report their revenue, something that we would certainly uh, not like here in the United States. Um, but no, we don't do that yet. We, As we get larger, we will. Yep. Okay, good. And then put this, uh, I remember, I think you said you launched in 2011. Is that right? Uh, yes, we did. Yes, we did. 2011. And then um, when, so one thing I always like to ask, and this is especially true for you, because I think you, you if I remember right, when you came on back in September 2016, you guys had raised $19 million? We had. Yes, yeah. correct. How much well, today? I, yeah. 19 million. Yeah. Any more since then or, or still 19 million total? We just took some debt, which ah. is very common. So once you start having a, you know, a regular revenue stream, we took some debt. Um, and then we took a strategic investment last, uh, last summer. So that, was, uh, yeah, yeah. So that was, but just, that was small. Who was the strategic? Was it public? Uh, so, uh, well, yeah, I, well, actually, I, I think it's public um, for well, sure. Here, let's make it public. Who was it? <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, the um, founder who's no longer CEO of, of Morningstar. So you would probably know him well. So, Well, look, this is an interesting add on to a pitch book kind of hub and spoke M&A roll up in the data space kind of model. Right. I mean, are you in acquisition talks right now with Morningstar? Oh, well, first of all, I couldn't comment on that if we were. But no, we are not. I can I'll I'll. Uh, uh, say that no, that's not Morningstar isn't exactly where we go. Although there's a lot of really interest, we have several um, uh, hedge fund customers um, that use us to get our data. Um, obviously, as you well know, on Wall Street, having yeah. any sort of edge on any sort of data about companies that you might invest in is huge. So we have a lot of customers there. But no, Morningstar it's not in the. Yeah. Okay. So total, total in the company then at this point is, is, is what 20, 21, 22, like how much debt did you end up taking? Uh, three. So total would be, if you include debt, 25, 25. Okay. So this, listen, this debt model is uh, becoming very interesting. A lot more SaaS companies are doing this because you preserve equity, right? As the founder, who did you choose to work with on the debt deal? Was it like a CIBC or Hercules or Tamir or what? We actually worked with Silicon Valley bank. Ah, uh, okay. So this was very much like a three, four, 5% term loan kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Did they take uh, warrants? Yes. In Jim, Jim's given up warrants now. I would never have expected this. Why'd you do that? 
uh, that's just the model. It's a small amount of warrants, really. I mean, it, 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 at the high level, it's just a mechanism for taking you know capital into your business uh, to grow um, without giving up so much equity. So it's a far, it's far less dilutive than equity. Warrants yep. are just a model to do that. Yeah, very good. Okay, so launched in 2011. Uh, uh, your first line of code was then, I know you were building this freemium model and you could afford to do it because you were able to tell your jigsaw story and raise a lot of capital up front. How much total capital, do you remember this? This is probably gonna be painful. How much total capital did you spend before your first dollar of revenue? Do you remember? Oh boy, that'd be tough. We we pushed off revenue for a long time to grow our user base over a million. Um, and so I would say, what was it, 24? 14. So we had raised certainly, you know, that 19 before first dollar of revenue. Yeah, so that's but, what I'm saying. You spent the, you, you potentially spent many millions between 2011 and 2014, correct? Yes. Yeah. But no way do you do that without having a prior, you know, jigsaw was a, was a great outcome. No way does that happen. And, you know, without that. So. All right. Very good. So build the MVP first dollar revenue was in 2014. What was that first deal size? Was it like a hundred grand or you went right for a million, a million bucks a year up front? Uh, it was, I remember our first deal, um, was over, it was six figures. Um, and I remember going, we're going to set, I wanted to set the mindset of our whole team that, Hey, this is worth six figures. So, um, that was, uh, that was fun to do. We do deals that are much smaller than that as well, but that was our first deal. Well, it's interesting that's what you lead with because there's so many companies in this space. Let's look at Mattermark, for example, right? They had a lot of data, but ultimately it just failed. I mean, flash shell for 500 grand. So you're probably your friend at, I don't know if you know, Barb, you probably do at full contact. And, uh, and I mean that, that model where you try and sell a million salespeople at 50 bucks a month just didn't work with data, but I doubt they tried anything like what you're doing, which is just sell the hedge funds for a million bucks a year. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, I remember Mattermark at the time, um, because I think it was Danielle was the CEO. I can't remember yeah. the founder. Yeah. She was really good at getting PR. I mean, she got, you know, she was great about that. I remember there was a few people on our team and I had a board member that in particular was worried about Mattermark. And I, I remember going, mm -mm, this one's not going to work. You Why did you know so clearly? Um, because they were all over the, the map on their business model. Um, you know, I could tell, I don't know, you just start getting a smell about these companies now where, you know, to me, what it's all about is how do you get market separation, right? I, I get up on stage all the time and preach. There's no new ideas. It's just new execution. And I think I was reading some of the bullet points on your book. Yeah. I was going to say, Jim, that's exactly, I said the exact same thing. Exactly. I saw it like something about how to copy without being, you know. and my main point is, is it's all copying. I mean, it really is. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci thought of the helicopter, right? He just couldn't, didn't have the ability to execute on it, right? And so my main point is, is that um, to me, we, you know, business information companies have taken lots and lots of funding. Some have been very successful. Um, I just knew that the way that their model, it was, they just didn't have a clear concept. They were kept jumping around and you have to kind of stick to it and really figure out that repeatable sales model. Yep. No, I mean, you're exactly right. They pivot all over the place. Okay, good. So that's good to understand. Uh, you again, 2011 was your date, uh, fast 2014, first dollar revenue. How many customers now serving today? Boy, well, as you well know, uh, or we haven't talked about yet, I'm now executive chairman. I, um, one of the things that's really fun is when you step aside and say, stay super engaged in the business from a strategic perspective, but no longer carry that heavy operational burden. Um, I don't know the exact number, but we have um, certainly over a hundred customers. Um, I'm not sure the exact number. Hundred and and when, what was the day? When did you walk away from CEO role and switch to chairman? Uh, two two summers ago, exactly. But it had really been in the works for a year before that. Um, in fact, I've been grooming my you know our current CEO Tim Harsh, who's awesome, and hopefully one day I'll be on this podcast with you. Uh, <laughs> And uh, running a much larger company than I ever did, i.e. Owler becomes much bigger than Jigsaw ever was. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I had kind of groomed him from the beginning. He was, uh, funny enough, he started um, um, just out of Dartmouth. He was my super intern. We had a whole string of Dartmouth interns at Jigsaw because one of my investors, Jeff Crow from Norwest Ventures, you know, went to Dartmouth and he would always funnel us these awesome, you know, college kids who were interns. Tim was the best of them all. And I told him after he was an intern at, at Jigsaw, the good news is you're the best intern I've ever had. The bad news is if you don't come work for me, I'm going to tell everyone you suck. <laughs> 
so he ended up coming and working working for Owler as our you know first employee. And uh, I was grooming him from the beginning because I knew he had the skills, you know, to become CEO one day. And there, no, no family connection there, right? Tim Harsh? No, yeah. no, no, okay. no way. Well, for some reason, my, my, my research team had said that to ask you about it was our family connection with the with the pass off to the to, to, to the current CEO. So no, no family relations there. Oh, no, no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, if you looked at Tim, Tim's. Tim's super handsome guy. He looks like a Ken doll. Is what I heard him, you know. <laughs> that's, and, uh, maybe, that's the perfect kind of guy to potentially run this kind of company, right? You're, you're, oh yeah, he's got that perfect UI. The mad, the mad men, the bad men kind of deal things going down. Oh, for sure, for all sure. Right. Jim, all right. There's some other questions here, especially because you learned all this at Jigsaw. I would I have to ask about these because we're going to learn a bunch. Uh, expansion revenue is critical in any SaaS company, right? So, what mechanisms are you are using to drive contract values in year one? You know, to doubling in year two and three. Um, so, you know, from a SaaS perspective, you know, I'm sure your readers have all read Byron Dieter's 10 laws of being sassy that I think he wrote back in 06 and then just re redid 10 years later, um, or 12 years later, Byron, I know Byron, he's a close personal friend. And I think, you know, I'll just stand on the shoulders of giants here when it comes to how to do this kind of stuff in SaaS. But for us, it's really about, um, you've got to, Year one is all about making sure they understand the value. There's a big upfront um, investment for most SaaS or DAS, data as a service customers, which is what we are. And then it it takes a long time to actually implement it, even though you say, hey, you know, it's out in the cloud. You don't have to install anything. It's, you know, the, the, the dirty little secret of SaaS is that it's much more difficult to install and use, especially when you're trying to figure out the data side of it. So for us, it's really about making sure they understand the value of the data and having a, uh, uh, a customer success or renewals person on from the beginning. That's critical. And so a couple of questions around that. So first off, if you look at gross revenue churn, so before expansion over the past 12 months or the last 12 months that you were there, the last 12 months that you remember, what was gross revenue churn? Ah, uh, boy, again, because I, it's been two years. These yeah. are the details. What I know is, is that, you know, if your churn is anywhere above, you know, 10%, you're a host. So you are, you are below, you are below 10% annually. Oh, for sure. I'm guessing. And again, Tim would have to ask it's below five. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and of course that's just, well, that's okay. It depends on how you look at churn. Is that new or old? Right. Because, you know, then you have growth of year one deals. Ignore the growth for a second. Yeah. Just gross revenue churn on the historical core that signed up a year ago. is It sounds like less than 5%. And the next question is how much have you guys, ex do you expand that same cohort over the first 12 months? I assume it's going to be more than 5%. Oh, for sure. If not, again, you're, you're dead meat yeah. in a SaaS yeah. model. You so are you, are you above 140 net? Is your expansion more than 40 or 50% year over year on those historical cohorts? Ooh, good question. I don't know the exact answer, but I'm guessing that we are not that high, but, um, I'd say we're probably more than the 30%, you know, growth. Yep. I'm guessing hundred. So if it's 30% and five churn, you're talking like 125 net. Um, I'd say it's probably more like 130 net, 130 or above. That's, okay. that's what, what sticks to me from last year. But again, remember, you know, we're still relatively early in, uh, on this and you know these first couple of years it's kind yeah. of jank, right? Well you've got your, your average contract size though obviously obviously you have some that are a million but but I mean would you say your average is more like a hundred thousand dollars across all your customers is that a fair enough average a fair average? Yeah sure I think directly correct. Yeah. yeah 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 and then look look um I mean that that's helpful to understand like expansion and churn metrics there. Now the second question I have for you there is obviously you raised a bunch of capital up front right how aggressive were you willing to be with user acquisition? Were you happy with a 12 month payback on a hundred thousand dollar year one AC TV? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, the good news is, is that SaaS model is now well understood. I mean, it's been, you know, over a decade or, you know, two getting on, if you will. I mean, obviously, you know, we don't, SaaS is still used, but, you know, Mark Benioff, the, the, the positioning genius out there, I've had many conversations with him personally, and no one positions better than Mark. I mean, he is the animal of it, you know, really kind of taking the whole conversation more about cloud, right? But we still you know, use this term SaaS as you will. Um, so, you know, the, the metrics for this are all now well known. I mean, everyone understands if you're not getting there, it, customer acquisition is always very expensive in SaaS. 
because yeah. you're not getting that huge upfront. That's why SaaS models usually have to raise a lot of capital. So where, where are you? So let's say you spend a hundred grand to get a for a hundred thousand dollars and, and, you know, contract value year one, where are you spending that hundred grand typically? Is it sales commissions, direct paid spend? Yeah, for us, because, um, we're very specific about how we go. You know, we, we aren't big enough yet to go do a lot of the advertising and do like a big, huge dream force. Um, obviously, you know, Salesforce is a, is kind of a one of a kind. I mean, Mark just went go big, go home from the very beginning and, you know, got to tip the cap to the guy. He's just created an amazing company. Um, although I'm not going to lie, I've been predicting ever since they bought us that this thing's got to slow down at some point, you know, and it just keeps it rolling. Just keeps going. So where are you, where are you, where are you spending that money though, then if it's not on direct paid? We, uh, we spend our money mostly on sales, um, a bit on marketing. We're very specific and targeted on marketing. And of course for us, luckily we use our own database. I mean, we have 3 million, over 3 million growing quickly. Uh, I think we're going to, we'll certainly be over four by the end of the year, maybe even five. Um, but, uh, we use our own database a lot. Yeah. What's growing, what's growing so many new of these free signups so quickly. Cause there's not really like a invite your team member mod. I mean, I obviously use a tool. I can't spot any kind of viral coefficient flywheel or anything. Yeah, no, it, it just, it is what we just believe from the very beginning is create a great product and people talk about it. And what's driving us surprisingly is news. Um, and really, I think the number one use case on this thing is it's just a really great replacement for uh, Google Alerts. And Google Alerts is just really messy. And this is just gives you a really clean interface and there's a lot more data input on it. And so I really think it's the news that drives it. People just need that news. And I was surprised because I really felt like when we founded the company that news was such a commodity. But it turns out really well curated news. And we spent a lot of time on our engineering team. And we have a team in India that actually hand curates parts of it for the really important companies. How many engineers total? Um, so we have data folks that I'm not going to leave in this, right? That th Those are just, you know, folks that actually look at the data from a human perspective and then give data, you know, give feedback to the algorithm. But uh, our engineering team is now oh, 12. Okay. And t total team, do you know? Uh, total teams, uh, oh gosh, 40, 40 folks. Okay. Very good. All right. Good before. And then look growth. I'm curious growth year over year revenue wise. You got hundred percent, hopefully 200%, something like that. Or, or what's growth at? Oh, for sure. I mean, but again, it's easy to do hundred percent growth small you numbers. Know, when you're small. Right. But I mean, and the, but the reality is any company, in fact, my, you know, Jeff Crow is now rockstar VC who was on my board at Jigsaw. Jigsaw was his first his win. investment as a VC back in the, back in the day. And, you know, now he's doing huge deals like he did lending club. Um, anyway, uh, you know, Jeff said, Hey, any company that is doubling its revenue year over year is doing great. Now, granted, it's much easier to do when the number's small. Uh, but yeah, for the last couple of years, we've doubled our, our, our revenue. But, uh, you know, that's, it's going to be harder to do this year. Obviously, um, yeah, it gets bigger numbers. What I mean, what is what's the big revenue target this year? The uncomfortable one where if you hit it, you're celebrating. If you miss it, it's like, eh, we'll get it next year. Oh, boy. Um, oh, boy. I'm not sure. You know, this is one, Nathan, I want to be careful about. Tim's the CEO. And uh, I think I'm be stepping on on his stuff a little bit. I, it's not that I'm trying to avoid your question. Well, we, we actually, we actually have Tim on hold. I'm a call him right now. Give me one second. No, I'm <laughs> totally, Jim, I'm totally kidding. I'm kidding. No, um, no, no, Jim. The re the reason I ask is, so you said a hundred customers kind of average ACV of a hundred thousand bucks, right? I mean, if those numbers are directionally correct, that would put you at about $830,000 a month right now in revenue or about a $10 million run rate. So without pushing you harder, is it fair to say you're about a $10 million run rate today? Uh, uh, I'd say that um, that might be a little bit uh, higher than can you, we actually can you, really you are. You have a couple months le left in the year. Do, I mean, do you think you can pass that this year or you're going to need another couple quarters? You are. You need to be like an investigator on uh, – on, uh, you can solve a lot of crimes. I'm too. asking – I'm just <laughs> asking the right questions. Only based <laughs> off numbers – only numbers you gave me. You said 100 customers, $100,000 ACV average. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, if we hit 10 million in revenue this year, I would do cartwheels. I'd be so thrilled. <laughs> good answer. That? Good. That's a fine answer. I, I'm good with that. All right, Jim, let's wrap up with a famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Uh, you know, I think it's changed from the last one. I was looking at my answers from the last time, which was, uh, which was good to great. Yep. I'm going to argue now there was just I, the innovators dilemma by Clayton Christensen. I just read that 
And it's just like this work of art, I think. It, both The Innovator's Dilemma and the, the follow on The Innovator's Solution, which really in some ways is almost one book. I just think it's so fascinating in the way that it talks about innovation. So that's my number one now. Number two, is there a C besides your own, obviously, is there a, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Uh, yeah, I've been, uh, obviously Bezos since we've, we've talked has really emerged. I just find him so fascinating. Um, so yes, I'm really, uh, paying close attention to him, but so is everyone that's boring. I know I wish I had something more esoteric for you, but he just fascinates me. No problem. All right. Number four or number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your company besides your own? Ooh, boy. Um, HubSpot is just crushing it for us. Um, we're watching those guys just go bananas and we use them and they're fantastic. Number four, how many hours of sleep again? Uh, more now than I'm executive chair, <laughs> not gonna lie. Uh, it was probably certainly six or, or at best, I'd say I'm more getting seven, seven-ish now, maybe even a little tiny, but I'm enjoying it. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not as much in our, I'm not as much in our, yeah, that's good. Remind everyone's situation. Married, single, kids? Uh, I'm single. Not, no kiddos running around? Uh, I do. I have a, uh, my son's 18 and just graduated from high school. He's got Very long cool. blonde hair, by the way, for any of you who are actually <laughs> looking at me. There I'm like, go. son, you better enjoy that. He's doing awesome. <laughs> that's good. One kiddo and how old are you, Jim? I'm 54. Take us home. Last question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? Ooh, boy. Um, how to breathe. <laughs> just... Don't be in such a hurry. Take more time to breathe and it'll come a little easier for you. Guys, Jim Fowler founded Owler.com, raised 19 million bucks to get it going after he sold his last company, Jigsaw, to Salesforce for well over $100 million, now serving over 100 customers, paying caught between fifty dollars and $100,000 a year on average, with eyes on that caught $10 million run rate in the next couple quarters. We'll see if they do it. Uh, in the meantime, again, teams 40 people, growing 12 engineers, 5% gross revenue churn annually, but 35% expansion puts them up in the 130-ish percent range in terms of net revenue retention. Totally comfortable economics wise with his 12 month payback period as they chase additional million dollar data deals with folks like hedge funds. Jim, thanks for taking us to the top. Pleasure, Nathan.